Hey guys, so thanks to Keysight, I'll be doing an introduction to antenna design with their FieldFox unit. I'll be covering a variety of different antennas and what they're typically used for, as well as the pros and cons of the designs. In this video, I'll go over some of the terminology we'll be using in the series. The antenna system is often described as a complex RLC network consisting of a resistive component, an inductive reactance, and a capacitive reactance. At specific frequencies, the inductive reactance and capacitive reactants cancel each other out and we're left with a purely resistive antenna. At these frequencies, the antenna is said to be resonant. In order to minimize power losses, we need to match the antenna's impedance to the device's impedance. The majority of transmitters and transceivers have an output impedance of 50 ohms. Now you might be wondering why 50 ohms, and there's a good reason for it. The reason for the popularity of the 50 ohm standard is because in the late 1920s, researchers from Bell Labs found that an impedance of 30 ohms was best suited for power handling, and an impedance of 75 ohms was best in terms of the signal quality. The 50 ohm standard was decided on because it's a great balance between power handling and signal quality. To see a practical example of this across a frequency span, we can look at a Smith chart. Smith chart is used to plot the impedance of an antenna throughout a defined frequency range. So what we're looking at is everything in the top hemisphere has a net capacitive reactance, and everything in the bottom hemisphere has a net inductive reactance. The center line represents the resistive component of the impedance, and everything that crosses this line represents the resonant frequencies of the antenna. Okay, so here I have a simple 5.8 gigahertz antenna, and I have the Smith chart plotting from 5 gigahertz all the way to 7 gigahertz. So because the transmitter is expecting a 50 ohm load, we want to be as close to this 50 mark and as close to this line as possible. Remember I said that this line here, everything that crosses this line, is a resonant frequency of the antenna. So we hook it up, and we see I have a marker set to 5.8 gigahertz, and it's very close to the line, and it's very close to the 50 mark so this wouldn't require any matching. Now you see that this antenna has several resonant frequencies across the span and so uh, those would work but it would require matching to 50 ohms because the transmitter is expecting 50 ohms. So this antenna has another resonant frequency of 6.5 gigahertz and the impedance is roughly 144 ohms. So if the transmitter is expecting a 50 ohm load and we give it a 144 ohm antenna, it's really not going to radiate very well. Uh, it'll work, uh, and it might work for your application, but if we want the best antenna possible, we want to match our transmitter to our antenna and get as close to the 50 mark as possible. Another graph we can look at is the VSWR graph. VSWR stands for Voltage Standing Wave Ratio, and we often just shorten it to SWR. The SWR is determined by the amount of the transmitted signal that is reflected back to the transmitter and is essentially a measure of how well an antenna is matched to its source impedance. A perfect match is 1 to 1, but a ratio of 2 to 1 is what most manufacturers aim for and is often how they list the bandwidth of their antenna. An antenna with an SWR of 2 to 1 at a given frequency will radiate a little under 90% of the power that is fed into the antenna and reflect back the rest. SWR is really important when analyzing an antenna, but just because an antenna has a low SWR doesn't mean it's a good antenna. For example, if we take the SMA connector and solder a 50 ohm resistor between the center conductor and the outer casing and connect it to the network analyzer, we can see that it has a SWR under 2 from DC all the way to 3 gigahertz. But it would make an awful antenna because it doesn't really have any radiating elements. Another important factor when analyzing an antenna system is balanced and unbalanced cables. When we have two identical conductors carrying current in opposite directions, the fields they create cancel each other out. If the two conductors are not identical, like coax cable, you're left with a feed line that radiates some of the transmitter's power. Even though coax cable is not a balanced cable, it only becomes a big issue if you're running long lengths of cable. In that case, you'll want to use what's called a ballon. The name ballon comes from the device's function, which is to adapt a balanced line to an unbalanced line. You can also find balance that will not only balance your feed line, but also transform impedances to help with matching your antenna to its source impedance. In this series, I won't really be going into feed lines because I'd like to just focus on the antenna designs themselves. Hope you liked the video, and I'll see you next time.